So how are y'all doing tonight? Y'all blessed? Amen. Praise God. So this is just, you know, I don't usually title Wednesday night, but Danielle's kind of been getting on me. I guess she puts it on the little thing to announce we're doing a little Facebook. So if I was going to title tonight, because it's really Romans chapter 10, and I think we'll do 11, and then I think we're going to go back into the Old Testament. I was kind of trying to hold off for Pastor Kirk and his wife Brenda to get back from Dallas, because I was going to try to get them to do a little, you know, short series on the gifts of the Spirit. But I just feel like they over there doing the work of the Lord, and we just don't know when they're going to be back. So we're going to transition back into the Old Testament. Amen? All right. Well, let's go ahead, and I'm going to go ahead and open up the Word right here. We're going to be in Romans chapter 10. I'll go to the King James Version. I know y'all like that. Let's see here. Romans. All right, y'all ready? Here we go. Let's just go ahead and read the the first four verses, and then we'll just kind of start to get into it. He says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. And so there's a lot that he's actually saying in these four verses of scripture that could be unpacked and we can talk about it. But I want to just kind of share with you the idea that the apostle Paul, he's focusing in on the nation of Israel or those that are born of that descent. It's important for, you know, we're all at different levels of our understanding of the Bible. So just be patient, some of you that have been Bible students for years, and some, because we got to understand that we're going to continue to grow together. And hey, listen, you should be happy to hear the Word of God over and over again. That's how I look at it anyway. But um, look, God's people, Israel, are a special group of people. And he even said it in Romans chapter 9, last week we talked about it, that to them were the fathers, and Brendan helped us out with what that was, right? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the fathers. To them were the fathers, the promises. God gave Moses promises. God gave Abraham promises. In your seed, all nations of the earth shall be blessed. That was a promise that God gave to Abraham. So, info, 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 I don't know if they really did that or not, but we're talking about the legit Shekinah glory, the glory cloud that followed Israel, amen, and he promised, he said, listen, I'm going to be a cloud in the day, I'm going to be a pillar of fire by night, and when I get to move and you got to move, and when I stop, you stop, and you set up camp, God's presence was with Israel, and it's important that you and I understand what that even means, because again, there was a time when there was no nation that belonged to Israel. See, you and I would be lost, like Sister Toot used to say back whenever I used to go to her church, you more lost than a little turkey or a little goose, one of them, in high weeds. In other words, there ain't nobody could see, you don't know where you're going, and that is the world without Jesus, my friend. And it had to start in order to get us to Jesus, God's plan included a nation. And the nation that God chose from all the nations of the earth, That's why it's important that we understand the Tower of Babel, because it was at Babel that God divided the nations. And none of those nations belonged to God at that point, because those nations willingly chose to separate themselves from God. They didn't want to serve God. They worshiped false gods. And so God created a nation for himself out of one man named Abraham, and through that nation, he gave a promise. And he said, through your seed, all nations of the earth shall be blessed. The Apostle Paul tells us in Galatians 3, he didn't say seeds as of many, talking about the nation itself, but one seed, his, and he is the Christ. And so all throughout the ages of Israel, God through the prophets let them know, hey, the Christ is coming. Messiah is coming. That word Christ and Messiah mean the same thing. It means the anointed one. Messiah is Hebrew. Christ is Greek. But the point is, is that nobody knew his name was Jesus until he started to reveal himself, until Jesus became flesh and lived on the earth. 
Nobody knew that Jesus was the fulfillment of all of those Old Testament prophecies. And for you and I, it's kind of easy once we get saved to look backwards. If we study the Bible, we can see in those places because the Holy Spirit makes it real to us. God was talking about Jesus the whole time. We just didn't know what his name was going to be till he showed up and he did what it is that he did. And then some people would say, nah, yeah, but man, that's just a story in a book written by the hands of man. You don't know what you're talking about. And you're like, let me tell you something, buddy. You might have an argument. You might think that you've got some scientific knowledge, but you will never be able to convince me that the story in this book isn't real. I, because, let me tell you why. Because Jesus has come alive on the inside of my heart. Amen. And, when Je- and so you may not want to talk about it, and that's fine, because I'm not going to throw pearl before swine. I'm not trying to call nobody a pig. I'm just trying to make a point. Jesus said, don't throw your pearl before swine because a pig doesn't know what to do with a pearl any more than an unbeliever who has no interest in the things of God knows what to do with the pearl of the gospel. And so, you know, so there's no sense in wasting your time with that. But at the same time, God has called us to share this glorious good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so that's where Paul is now. Paul was one of those very people, a man that was overwhelmed by the, by the zeal of religion, the religion of the Jews. And he just thought, listen, you would defend your faith, would you not? I mean, you wouldn't go around killing people, but you would defend your faith. I believe you would. Well, that's what the apostle Paul thought he was doing the right thing. He was defending the faith of the Israelites. He was defending the Abrahamic covenants, the no, the, the you know, the the covenant that God gave to Moses. He was defending his nation and his heritage and his religion, and he just, he just really didn't know any better. Okay, but there he goes on his road to Damascus. Y'all remember the story, and the light shined from the sky, and it knocked him down to the ground, and the voice from heaven spoke to him and said, Saul, that was his name before his conversion, Saul, Saul, why, why do you kick against the pricks? Why, why, are you come, why are you coming against me? The pricks is like a goad. It's like a sharp stick that they would stick in the hindquarters of an animal, just like now they got electric prods nowadays. Back then they didn't have that, and they'd poke them to get them going in the direction. The Lord was saying to Saul, you're kicking against the pricks. In other words, I'm over here trying to, I am poking you, Paul, but it's because I'm trying to get you to go in the right direction. How many times is that true for our own lives? It's like the Lord's over there poking us in the hindquarters, and we're over there kicking like an old donkey or like, like some kind of animal that's trying to get away, Lord. Shoo, get away. And the, Lord, the Lord's not going to quit on us. I mean, if you have ever really given your heart to the Lord, or if there's a place in your heart, and if you have ever tried to cry out from a genuine heart some point in time at nighttime, and you cried on the Lord, listen, he heard that cry. The word of God says, even for his children of Israel, in the time frame when they were Egyptian slaves, he said, I heard the cry of my people, and I will send a deliverer for them. I just want to encourage you tonight to know that if you've ever cried that cry, God will send a deliverer. God has sent the deliverer. Amen. He's going to just need to make it real in your heart and in my heart that we would continue on in the race. And so there you go, the Apostle Paul. He says, who are you, Lord? I'm, I'm, the, I'm the Lord, whom you, whom you, you know, you're kicking against the pricks. And, and, and then he was gloriously saved. Hallelujah. He went through his time, and he writes this letter. But now, as he's explained to us all the things in the book of Romans that we went through, what true righteousness is, what it means to be justified by faith, we talked about that quite a bit. You know what justification is? Limitation is 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 A little bit more. You're just going to have to read a little bit more. You're going to have to come to church a little more often. You're going to get involved in a little bit more ministry. You're going to quit. Go, you know, no, no, no. No, God says that if you're in Christ, only you, and, only you and the Lord know whether you're in Christ. If you're in Christ, you are a new creation. And God says justified, meaning you're innocent. Not because of what you do, but because of what Jesus did and your acceptance of Jesus' sacrifice by faith. 
See, when you accept Jesus' sacrifice by faith, then the Holy Spirit clothes you in the righteousness of the Christ. Hallelujah. And now when God the Father sees you, he no longer sees your guilt and your failures. And then the question would be, like they asked Paul, oh, so what, I can just do whatever I want to do? No, of course not. The idea is is that when the Lord comes in and he brings deliverance and he brings freedom. See, there's a rest in understanding justification. There's a rest in that. What are you talking about? Most people walk around under a cloud of guilt, condemnation, feeling unworthy, a dark cloud that sits upon their back, a burden that is heavier than a cement sack, and it just burdens them down. But I got good news that guess what? When you call upon the Lord and you mean business with God, oh, but I have called on the Lord. I did mean business. Well, keep on calling, my friend. Keep on calling on the Lord. Keep on knocking, amen, and he will answer you. And when he does, your heart is going to be flooded with the grace and the strength. You think think I'm up here? I don't know. I mean, why would I be up here acting like this? Because his his grace flooded my heart one day. More than one day, many days, I've seen the delivering power of God. I got a long way to go. Hallelujah. But I'm so glad that God showed up and convinced me. The world ain't got nothing for me, my friend. I don't have no desire to go back to that world. That world ain't done nothing but try to destroy me, beat me up, and throw me in a ditch. If I wasn't just jumping out of a car and landing in a ditch on my own, that's how stupid I was. Nevertheless, that's what the world will do to you. It will try to destroy you, right? The Apostle Paul experienced that same righteousness, and I just want to remind you, that's what the Apostle Paul spoke of so much about justification by faith, about what true righteousness is. And I need you to know that he taught us that in the early parts of the book. And so now he's saying, my brethren, Israel, my desire for them is that they would be saved. He says, I bear record of them that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. And, you know, if you read it in the, if you read behind some Greek commentators, they'll say, it's, the idea is that Paul's talking from experience. Like, I, too, used to have zeal for God, but without knowledge. Meaning, you know, the word zeal, it means like an intense devotion, eagerness, or enthusiasm. Whenever he was trying to destroy Christians, he was full of zeal. But he did not have knowledge. He had knowledge of the Old Testament. He had knowledge of the temple, the tabernacle, the Levitical sacrifices, and all that stuff that they did in the Old Testament. But he did not have knowledge that the fulfillment of all of those things was Jesus until the Lord showed up and changed him. Amen? And then God did the work on the inside of his life. And so he's trying to say this. He's like, look, they were ignorant of God's righteousness. And so, therefore, they go about establishing or trying to establish their own righteousness. But ultimately, they have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. You know, they're ignorant. They're ignorant of the things of God. But look, you know, I put this in my notes. Sometimes people want to remain ignorant. <laughs> Did you, do you know that? I mean, come on now. Help me out here. Sometimes people want to remain ignorant. Sometimes people hold on to their little pet doctrines and they hug them. And they're like, don't mess with that. Don't mess with that preacher. Don't mess with that part of my life. I want to hold on to this. I want to stay ignorant in this particular area. That's not the will of God. The will of God is that the word of God would come in and it would break through all of those things, all of those mindsets that are not proper. I understand that I'm just a man And that you have to be careful that you don't just believe everything that I say up here. Okay, and I I have never encouraged you to do that. Never once have I ever encouraged anybody to ever do that. You know, I remember one time I got into an argument with some old boy, and he's like, man, they just drinking the Kool-Aid over there. And, you know, and and I I say it all the time lately, I've been saying, you know, you just brainwashing people. No, no, we're washing our brains. We're not being brainwashed. But I've never once expected anybody, but instead, I want to just speak the truth to you, and then you would study for yourself, like the Bible says, that the Bereans in the book of Acts were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they studied the scriptures for themselves. You know, the Lord gave me that revelation. Listen, I don't care what preacher you're listening to. 
If you just believe everything that comes out of that preacher's mouth, woe to you, my friend. Because the word you need to check what these people are saying, whoever they are, I don't care how much you love them, you need to check and you need to go back to the word of God. Amen. And you need to study to show yourself approved. A workman that rightly divides the word of truth will not be ashamed. So they're ignorant, but sometimes people want to remain ignorant. They have an intense desire to be the righteous ones, but being ignorant of God's righteousness. Well, who is, what is God's righteousness? Y'all remember that? Huh? What you said? Somebody said it. Yes. Thank you, sir. No, you did great, man. You gave us the perfect answer. Jesus is God's righteousness. Look at this. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. I know you don't see his name there, but I got to tell you that the law, the righteousness of God, whenever it came to an end of the law, was manifest in Jesus. So it's important that you and I understand that God's righteousness is he has a name, and his name is Jesus. And we already talked about that when we covered it. But look. There's still people on earth that are going about trying to formulate their own righteousness. And it's important that you and I understand this because there's many believers in many churches that are still going around trying to formulate their own righteousness. It's, a, it's called a Christianity by works. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Have y'all ever been in this before? I know y'all didn't all just get saved yesterday, right? No. Y'all been in it a little while. All right, well, maybe, but if, but if you haven't been in it that long, let me just kind of share with you what can happen. You start to, when you give your heart to the Lord, you'll know, you know how you know you're saved? But we had some great questions from some of the young people. Oh, by the way, parents, we won't have the little Bible study thing this Thursday, but it'll be next Thursday if your kids can come back. It was good. It's hard for me to judge what they're getting out of it, but hey, you know. They asked some good questions, and we, we talked a lot. We, we talked about a lot of things. And I tried, to always, I tried to be mindful not to overdo it, but anyway. So, you know, now I lost my train of thought. <laughs> okay. Huh? Thank you. That was a question that one of the kids said. How do I know I'm saved? One, one kid asked, how do I get saved? Then another kid asked, how do I know I'm saved? You know, that's such an awesome question to ask. How do you know you're saved? Because in this passage of Scripture, it's going to mention to us where we get the idea of how we go about getting saved. A certain way to pray, a certain way to believe, and, and that's important because the Word of God says it. But you know, many times as in the faith, people would say, well, look, man, all you got to do is believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. I do believe that there's been a lot, and that is true. When you truly believe with your heart and confess with your mouth. See, the tricky trick is... Are we really believing with our heart or are we just believing with our head? Only the Lord knows when it goes from here to here. Once it goes from here to here, something miraculous happens. New birth, new life. The Spirit of God comes to live on the inside of you, and that's how you know you're saved, my friend. When the Spirit of God comes to live on the inside of you. So if the Spirit of God is taking residence in your heart, well, how do I know that, preacher? Because you ain't the same. <laughs> when you invited Jesus into your heart, well, I still got a lot of stuff in my life. That's not what I'm asking you. See, there was a time back when I was in the world before I ever gave my heart to Jesus that I loved living in sin. I loved it. I love the way it made me feel. I'm not saying I never disliked the repercussions of it. I'm not saying that I never liked waking up and finding all kind of injuries on my body. It's not even funny. All kind of crazy stuff from the night before. I didn't like that part of it, but I loved living a life of sin. But then once I give my heart to the Lord, guess what? The sin still can make your flesh feel good, but, but it don't, it's not the same. I don't feel good about it. I'm, the Holy Spirit's convicting me in those areas of my life. And so that's how you know if you got saved. If you prayed a prayer, if you invited Christ Jesus into your heart, if you repented of your sin, if you asked the Lord to forgive you, if you said, yes, Jesus, I believe you're the one. I believe you died. You may not have even known all that. I told you the story about that drug addict that was throwing needles up in the ceiling and one, he just started saying, Jesus. He, said, he got to a point of, of the end of himself and all he knew was that Jesus was the only thing that was going to help him and he had been resistant. And when he called on the name of Jesus, his life was transformed 
And listen, he was a preacher of the gospel until he died later from hepatitis C. But, I mean, he lived for a long time preaching the gospel and ministering, amen, to people's lives. And so I want you to know that that's how you're going to know. That's how you're going to know if you got saved. And that's how what true righteousness is. When the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart and begins to free you from the bondage and the guilt that you've been experiencing, it's because God is making a declaration over your life and he's saying, justified. You're innocent. You're no longer guilty. Can you believe that with me tonight? I hope you can. My prayer to the Lord is that you and I would be able to believe that. Because, listen, the opposite of that is that the enemy would whisper in your ears and he'd say, that preacher's lying to you. It can't be that easy. It can't be that easy just to trust God in his word and that he sent Jesus, the righteous one, to die for you, and all you got to do is keep your faith in that. No, what you got some stuff you got to do, Christian. You just sit back and rest. You sit back and rest and trust in the Lord and let God work in your heart, and guess what? You're going to be, one day, you probably be the hardest working person around, whether it's in the church, whether it's on your job, When the Holy Spirit has his way in the heart and life of a person, it's an amazing thing that will take place. Now you're going to have zeal with knowledge, amen? And, and, you know, whenever we're talking about the fact that Jesus is true righteousness, but yet these Israelite, these Jewish people that Paul's talking about, they're trying to establish their own righteousness through the things that they do. And, you know, I had a question, like, how is this really any different than than believers that try to live for God or try to uh, uh, earn righteousness from God through his own works. I know I say this a lot, and so I hope you don't get tired of me saying this, but I just want to kind of mention, to listen, the way I preach or teach, it's a little bit, it is a little bit deeper than just spitting scriptures at you, because the way that I say it it requires, at least this is what God has done to me, it, require, it requires we put our thinking cap on a little bit. It requires that we consider what the Bible is, is really saying. And so, and so whenever, how is it different from what the Jews did in their confusion to what a Christian still today in the modern church can still try to do in his attempt to earn righteousness with God? And I know I say it all the time, but look, Christians, when you're born again, the Lord will put a desire in your heart, or you will at least know, I'm supposed to read my Bible. Like, I need to read my Bible. If I'm going to know God more, i got to read the Bible. Can we all get an amen on that? Amen? Amen. If if I'm going to know God more than, than coming to church, at least if we have a church that's preaching the truth, I need to come to church, right? If I'm going to know God more, I need to spend some time in prayer. All those things are absolutely, unequivocally true. You can't get away from it. There, I could give you scripture upon scripture that show that. But if you're anything like me and you're taught that, the, that look, you know, sin is a problem. Now that you're born again, your sin has been forgiven. But in order to live for God, in order to walk a holy life, you got all these things that you got to do. And so now we change the way we look at reading the Bible. We change the way we look at prayer. We change the way we look at going to church. We change the way we, lo- we look at all these things. And we think that by doing things for God, that now we're earning favor for, with God. Now, we may not come out and say that. That's not what I'm trying to say. But if you know what I'm, if you know what I'm talking about, you've done it before. And you try to make promises to God. And you tell God you're going to do this. And you're going to do that. And the end result is that you end up just failing God. Because God's not going to share his glory with another. He's not going to let you keep your promises in your own strength. He's not going to let you try to earn righteousness and favor with him through the many things you do. Because then if he allowed you to earn that, then guess what? You would get glory instead of him. And so instead, that's not the way he's going to do it. You're going to trust in the Lord, and you're going to learn to to rest in the work that Jesus has done. And now the Father is going to clothe you with the righteousness of Jesus. And now grace can flow into your heart and in your life. All right, so let's look at verses 5 through 8. For Moses describes the righteousness which is of the law. 
that the man which does those things shall live by them. So in other words, I'm just going to tell you right now, what this is saying is, is that if you want to live according to the law, you got to get it right all the time, 100%. You ever seen where somebody will text you that back? I don't really like doing that. I did it a couple times. It feels weird. But they'll put 100%. Okay, 100% of the time. you got to do it right all the time. If you do 100%, dude, I'm so sorry I said that. That was inappropriate. So you just keep doing your 100%. But I'm just trying to say, you got to get it right 100% of the time all the time. You can't mess up one time if you're going to live according to the righteous. Did I get anybody mad with saying that? If I did, I'm so sorry. Y'all see what I got? I got a problem with my personality. Why I got to call people out about something silly like that? Lord, help me. So you got to get it right 100% of the time. You can't mess up one time. If you mess up one, but, but, but preacher, that's not, I'm doing good. I'm doing better than Mike Landry. I'm doing better than Gerald. I made it to church every service in, in August. Mike missed a service because he had to work. That's Mike's problem. Why Mike took that job where he got to work on a Sunday? Mike should have told him, no, I'm going to believe God. That's not what true righteousness is. See, you thinking that you're earning something from God, that what that turns into is relative righteousness. Or Mike might be thinking, I'm more righteous than the preacher. Because the preacher, he don't do certain things the way I would do it. And he might be right. I might not do it that way. And maybe some of the stuff I do ain't right. Okay, we good with that. I mean, we understand that, right? The preacher ain't got it all figured out. But what I'm saying is, I ain't confused into thinking that if I do something better than you do, now I'm more right than you are, because that's not how righteousness is judged by God the Father. Righteousness is judged by God the Father because he sent Jesus... And Jesus never messed up one time. Jesus did it the way that the Father wanted it done each and every time. And then he paid the debt for sin. Hallelujah. He took this sinless life and he offered it on the cross. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now, I know I've been saying this a lot lately, but I'm going to say it again. Now you got to go to the ATM. <laughs> And you got to punch in your PIN number. And you got to take your withdrawal, your withdrawal. And you got to take that, uh, and you got to make it for yourself. And your PIN number is your faith. And that means you're putting faith in God's plan. There's an account of righteousness waiting for you. And the way that you receive it is to go there and to believe it. Amen. I believe you, God. I believe you, Father. Thank you for sending your son to die for me. Amen. And I want that. Now, now look, you, sometimes I think we, you know how silly we are sometimes? They got folk that have been living in church. And listen, I ain't talking about something. If, if you got something you're struggling with, you know, look, the Lord will deliver you. I just want you to know that. Okay? The Lord will deliver you. You just got to keep on knocking. You got to keep on trusting. Okay? But sometimes people get this idea in their head that just because they go into church or just because they listen to a sermon every now and then or just because whatever, you know, that I'm serving the Lord. No, we either in or we out. We either serving the Lord or we're not. How do you act Monday through Saturday? That's what I want. I don't need to know that. I'm just trying to throw it. It's a rhetorical question. How do you act Monday through Saturday? Are you a servant of the Lord? I'm just going to be real with you. God is not looking for no part-time employees. Is it okay if I say it like that? Do you think that I'm being real with you? Do you think that I'm communicating the truth of the Bible to you? I hope that that sounds right. God is not. Jesus gave his whole life. Amen. Jesus came to the earth he was already the king of kings and the lord of lords. He was the eternal son. He already had the inheritance. He did not have to come down here. But yet he, in the mind of God, in the Godhead, in the counsel of God, he was willing as the eternal son to condescend. The Bible teaches that in Hebrews chapter 2, that Jesus condescended. It means he lowered himself. He didn't come to die for angels. He came to die for the seed of Abraham. Jesus condescended and lowered himself in humility. Hebrews talked about his humility. Philippians talked about his humility. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. 
though he was in the form of God, did not consider it something to be held on to, but instead he humbled himself and he lowered himself so that he could die even the death of the cross so that he could be a servant to the Father. Hallelujah. So, so God wants you and I to understand Jesus gave his whole life for us, and I'm just going to be real with you. God wants your life. Now, we can monkey around in this life, and we can skip, and we can trip, and we can go all over the place and do all, over, all of these things, but we got to understand we cannot fool God, so we need to quit fooling ourselves. You don't have to convince me. It's not your, my job for you to have to come tell me and pour out all of your stuff to me. I want you to know I love you. Amen. I hope you love me. I'm going to pray for you. You pray for me, but I just got to be real with you. God is looking for people to give their whole hearts to him. Now, is it a process? Yes. You can't make it happen overnight. You can't try to fake it till you make it. Sit back and rest and trust. Well, how did that verse go in that song? I will trust in you. I will trust in you alone, and I shall not be shaken. Dude, that was good. I don't know if it hit y'all like that, but in that verse of that song, I will trust in you alone, and I shall not be shaken. And I was thinking about no matter what we go through in life, you know, the problem is we ain't really just, we're probably not trusting in the Lord alone. I'm talking about myself, too. I'm just, you know what I'm saying? Sometimes when we feel the chaos and the lack of peace in our life, maybe we're not truly trusting in the Lord the way that we should. And, but the Lord wants you and I to learn how to trust in him. And that if we will, we won't be shaken. Can you believe that tonight? I hope you can. There's been a whole cloud of witnesses that have gone before us, Hebrew says. Isaiah, the Bible says, was sawn asunder. His family was killed. The apostle Paul, I know I say it all the time, got his head cut off. Peter was crucified upside down, you know, uh, Thomas was run through with a spear in Brahmin, India. You know, Mark was dragged behind a chariot in the streets of Egypt. And all they had to do was say, okay, I quit. <laughs> like, no, I was just joking, man. I, don't, I, don't really, I didn't really see the resurrected Savior. I was just joking. I didn't really see him. Like, stop. No. They refused to relent. They knew. They knew that the resurrected Savior, they had seen it with their eyes, and now they held it in their hearts. And they refuse, so I will trust in you alone, and I shall not be shaken. Amen? Amen. You know, the righteousness of the law demands that if you're going to do it, you got to get it 100%. You can't mess it up even one time. So all this monkey shine, like Brad used to say, all this, all this business about, oh, I'm a little bit better than you, and, and so therefore I'm more. No, it doesn't work like that. You either get it right done all the time, or, you, or you're not getting it right at all, if you're living under law. Okay, but if you're living under grace, and that's the contrast here, law righteousness versus faith righteousness. Law righteousness says you got to do this stuff and do it right all the time, not messing up even once, and then you will be righteous versus this idea. Look, let's just read a little bit more. But the righteousness which is of faith speaks on this wise. Say not in your heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above? Or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ again from the dead? But what says it? The word is near you, even in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we preach. Okay, so law righteousness says you got to do all of this stuff 100% of the time and you can't mess up even once. But... Faith righteousness is what that just said. I don't know about you, but this verse of Scripture always kind of gave me a little bit of trouble. So let's make sure we break it down a little bit. The righteousness is, which is of faith speaks like this. Say not in your heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above. <laughs> in other words, the idea is, what do you think the Christ is? Where do you think Jesus is? You think he's up in the sky somewhere? 
Like to a person that doesn't know, that never saw God, they might think, oh, Jesus is up in the heavens. Let me go take a plane ride and go up there and get him. That, that What they're really telling us here is that it's kind of ridiculous to think that you're going to be able to go through some kind of major ordeal to go up into heaven. You know, you're not Shazam. You're not Superman. You're not going to go up there and bring Jesus back down. Neither will you go down into the bottom of the earth where the dead live and bring him back up. But instead, what the word says, says is this what do we say the word is near to you even in your mouth and in your heart that is the word of faith which we preach so what i want you to know is this is that you know what what was the what was the name of my title righteousness is near call his name righteousness is near call his name that's what we were talking about right here that's what we're talking about is the fact that you ain't got to try to go up into heaven and bring him down and you ain't got to go in the abyss and try to bring him up he's right here it's the word of truth it's the word of righteousness and if you and i will call on his name see sometimes the lord has to get us in a predicament or a situation where we will call on his name because guess what happens man life happens life happens and we get hard and we get bitter, right? We make choices and decisions that bring us down a certain journey or a certain pathway. And along the way, people start to hurt us. People start to mess with us. People say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing. And guess what happens? The enemy loves it because we start to allow our heart to become callous. And when we, our heart becomes hard and callous because of what other people have done to us, but God's allowing it the whole time because he really wants you to be able to see your own self rather than focus on the other person, right? But yet, here we find ourselves in the midst of these situations, and all what God wants you and I to do is to call on his name. Call on the righteousness. His name is Jesus, and he's right there. He's right there. He's in your heart. He's even in your mouth. You can say it. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. The word of faith is right near you. Amen. Let's look at verse 9 through 13. If you would confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Listen. You don't have to know all of this information I'm about to give you to get saved. You just have to genuinely believe in your heart. Like I'm trying to tell you, that, that preacher, his name was Steve Hill. He was a heroin addict. He was shooting heroin. He was living in this old rinky-dink apartment. He, basically, all the homeless people would go because there was a mission in this city. And different people would take turns preaching. And they would even say comments like, okay, who's getting saved tonight? Somebody got to give their heart to the Lord in order for us to get a plate of food. We need some vittles. Who's going to walk the walk tonight? And they would sit there and they'd have this little powwow. And that's what, that's what it was all about. Just give me some free food, preacher. But how many times you reckon, boy, somebody was sharing with me. I don't, I don't want to necessarily call them out. Somebody was sharing with me, though. Dude, this is so powerful that they were incarcerated. And some guy that had HIV, asked permission, trying to talk to this person about the Lord. And it wasn't, really, it wasn't really hitting like that. And he said, can I just come and sit by you and just read the Bible? <laughs> and did that faithfully for like a while. <laughs> just sat there and read the Bible. And then when the time was right and the right mixture of circumstances takes place, Guess what happens? The Lord shows up and whatever your heart needs him the most. Because righteousness is right there. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. And you call upon his name. Hallelujah. Then guess what happens? The Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of the heart. The sin is forgiven. The debt is paid. Hallelujah. The bondage is broken. And the Holy Spirit says, now you belong to me. I'm moving in, son. I'm moving in, and guess what? My spirit wants to bear witness with your spirit that you are indeed the Son of God, and that righteousness now clothes you because you accepted my Son. See, well, I got to know all that stuff, preacher? No. 
we don't. Because I guarantee you, if we could get that guy to tell us right now, he'd be telling you, Lou, I don't even know how much I was remembering from what that guy was, was reading. And, and the guy, the preacher that was throwing the needles up in the ceiling, how much did he remember from the messages? You know what he remembered? He remembered exactly what the Holy Spirit wanted him to remember at the perfect opportunity and the perfect time so that he could use those words of truth to convict the heart, to cut the heart, and to say, hey, now what are you going to do with my son? And when we call on the name, hallelujah, it changes everything. I just want you to know it changes everything. But again, he's not looking for part-time employees. He's got, he's got, he's got full-time work. He don't want us living for him, straddling the fence, right, a little bit here, a little bit there. No, he wants the whole thing. Amen? What I speak to you is truth. You know, faith works like good seed on ready soil. The word about Jesus enters the ear, travels to the heart. The believer believes with the heart. And when he does, he has to say what I mean is he wants to say. See, look, when you get saved, you got to believe it in your heart. Let me, I can't, I can't make, you do, you know the name Jesus? It comes from the, the Hebrew Joshua, Yeshua. Some people say it like that. You know what Joshua means? Jehovah saves. You, you, you know what? He says, if you will believe with your, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. If you will believe in the heart and confess with the mouth. You know, I always like this word and I kind of, I tell y'all about it a lot. This word confess in the Greek, I, I love Greek words because, I don't know, there's just so much meaning in the words themselves. If we were going to separate this word, we would separate it here, but it's a compound word. There's no separation. Homologia. We typically pronounce the first word homo, but that's just weird to say it like that because then it invokes all kind of thoughts in your head. But the word homo or homo literally means the same. So that's what it means, right? So the word me mean, and logia means to speak. Okay, or to say, okay, and so when you confess, what you're doing is you're saying the same thing. So the word homologia in the Greek language would be used to, in Spanish, I think the word would be mismo. You could say it like mismo, same. I believe the same. Some Rush Limbaugh used to say ditto, right? Same. Right? So homologia means you're saying the same thing or you're agreeing with someone. Well, in the Bible, when you use homologia, who are you agreeing with? You're agreeing with God. You're agreeing with God's word. When you agree or confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you're agreeing with God that he is Yeshua, Joshua. He is Jehovah saves. He's the one that I need. And you believe in, as far as the word Lord goes, that it has the idea of deity connected to it. You're believing all those things. You're believing the truth about Jesus. You're believing he's the one that God the Father sent. You believe he's the sinless one. You believe that he's the one that died on the cross for your sin. And you're embracing that by faith. And when you do, true righteousness comes to live on the inside of your heart. Now, do you have to know all that? No. Just calling on the name of Jesus. God, God gives you credit for it. God gives you credit for it, amen, and what a good God. He gives you credit for it. I mean, I'm telling you, if we could, I just wish we had numbers. <laughs> How many people got saved just by saying Jesus? The point is, you're going to know when you get saved because the Holy Spirit's going to come to live in your heart, amen? Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. All right. So he says this, he says, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He, earlier on, I didn't read it, but he said, it doesn't matter whether it's Jew or Gentile. It doesn't matter whether you're from Israel or you're a Greek. If you just believe on the plan of God. What a, you know, if you think about it, I don't know if y'all think like this, but I think sometimes about God the way I think like my own life. What I mean is, like if I've been rejected what it feels like to be rejected. You know what I'm saying? You ever been rejected before? For whatever reason, whatever way, you were rejected by someone that you cared about and whatever, and it hurts. I was thinking about this on the way over here, how in the counsel of God, before Jesus became flesh, meaning before he became a man, 
right? You do understand that Jesus was in existence for all eternity. He's not a created being. That's what the Jehovah's Witnesses think, but that's a bunch of humbug, okay? Jesus is the eternal word. He's the eternal son. He is wisdom that was at the Father's side during creation. He is the, he is the, the word that spoke the worlds into existence. And in the counsel of God, Jesus was willing, like I said earlier, to condescend. Jesus was willing to humble himself in order to die. But see, before he's incarnate in flesh, not reincarnation, incarnation. Before he's incarnate in flesh, he's deity. So he's all-knowing, right? I mean, think about that. God is all-knowing. He's omniscient. That's what the word means. He's omnipresent. He's all-knowing. He's everywhere. Amen. And, and, and so Jesus, before he takes the role of the son becoming flesh, already knows how people are going to treat him. Think about that. But yet he does it anyway. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. The joy had to be connected to you because it sure wasn't joyful for him to die on the cross. Amen? So, so what I need you to know is that even in spite of the fact that he knew people were going to treat him harshly, they were going to spit on him and pull his beard out, they were going to thrust crown of thorns upon him, they were going to strip him naked, they were going to beat him with rods and whips, they were going to hang him on a cruel cross and let, leave him to hang naked in the noonday sun, sweating and bleeding and groaning and crying out, right, in all of this misery, even yet still, he knew all that was going to happen, but he chose to do that. And then to know that people were going to laugh at him during that time, and even to know that some of the people that you speak to, to try to tell them the good news about Jesus, are going to still reject him. And then you may also feel a little bit of rejection from that. Right? I mean, have you not tried to speak to some people about the Lord and that they reject you, they roll their eyes, they look at you like you're a quack, you know, he's crazy. Okay, but guess what? Just think of what they did to him. Amen? So when the seed of the gospel enters ready soil, amen, hope enters your heart, you're going to want to let somebody know. When you, you know, if you've been freed by the Lord, and you know, that was a big thing for me. When I got saved, and I don't want to, you know, do, take too much time with this, but when I got saved, I immediately, in my own way, wanted to start telling people about Jesus, because I knew I had been saved, but I struggled in my walk with God, but guess what? When the Lord showed up after my sister died, you couldn't hardly shut my mouth, man. You still, I'm telling you right now, I'll talk about some stuff, but, I'm, but look, if, if the topic comes up, especially with an unbeliever, oh my gosh. And so I can't even hardly shut my mouth. And I mean, at some point in time, I've realized, I mean, I've gone too far. I've used up all my words. I got to stop. I'm wearing them down. I'm breaking them down, you know, like maybe not in a good way. And I got to stop. But it's only because I'm excited. And I know some of y'all know what I'm talking about. I want to encourage you to know that when that type of joy enters into your heart, you got it. You're going to have to tell somebody. I was, I, as I was thinking earlier today, too, you know how there's been times in the church, and I'm not trying to fuss about it if you've told somebody this before. I've told people this before, but I don't know that I'm ever going to say it again. And if I do, maybe you should rebuke me. And I got a quote from a preacher, and, I'm gonna and whenever I read it, this is what I was thinking about. Leave, God, leave God's work to God. And many times, you know, whenever we say, hey, okay, if you want to receive the Lord, Go ahead and pray this prayer after me. Okay, and I don't have a complete problem with a prayer of salvation. I really don't because I'm sure people have gotten saved with that. But just because somebody prayed a prayer doesn't mean they got saved. And what I'm trying to say is this, is that when you do get saved, when you do pray from your heart and the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart, I ain't going to have to tell you, because you know, that's what they say. Okay, you gave your heart to the Lord. Go tell at least one person today you gave your heart to the Lord. Can I let you in on a little secret, my friend? If you truly get saved, you know how awkward that'd be? Like, I'm just like, oh, okay, the preacher told me to go tell somebody. I'm going, hey, I'm going to pick you. Hey, mama, I got saved today. Or, hey, you know, Jennifer, whatever your name is, uh, you know, I got saved today. I just wanted to let you know that. And hey, guess what? That's fine. There's nothing wrong with doing that. But what I'm trying to say is this. When the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart and you feel that cement sack fall off your back and you feel the Holy Spirit flood your heart with hope and joy, it ain't going to be able to shut your mouth. You're going to be talking to somebody about Jesus. Amen. God's going to do the work in you and they're going to really be, okay, that's good to hear. Can you stop now? 
or maybe not. They might just, tears might start streaming down their face. Has that ever happened to you before? Amen. What a, that's a glorious thing, to be ministering to somebody the gospel, and then all of a sudden you see the tears well up in their eyes. Praise God. That's a beautiful thing. Lord, fill us with your anointing. Amen. Do the work of the kingdom through us. Amen. All right. Let's read verses 14 through 17. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how, talking about people out there. Like, you know, I always preach to y'all and I say, hey, look, man, we got to, God wants to use us as a mouthpiece. And so the apostle Paul's saying, look, righteousness is right here. Call on his name. Amen. But how are they going to call on him of whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in whom? Thank God for that missionary that kept preaching in the streets to the homeless people and didn't get discouraged whenever he probably heard them talking one time. And he said, man, these people don't even really want the Jesus. All they cared about is these beans we serve in them. And I hear them talking behind the scene. But guess what? He didn't let it stop him. Whoever it was kept going, kept doing the work of the Lord. Amen. Who, how will they call upon him? And how are they going to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Now, i got to tell you that according to the Bible, in the book of, Je- in, I believe it's Exodus, it's in Exodus, the, Moses was t- said, you remember this? I, I, said, I shared this with you all a couple of times. There was two guys in the camp. I'm thinking they're twins. I can't prove it. Me, Dad, and Eldad was their names. Y'all remember that? Me, Dad, and Eldad. That's some weird names. Anyway, Joshua comes running. And he tells Moses, he says, there be two men in the camp, Eldad and Medad, and they do prophesy, and you got to stop them. And Moses says, excuse me? You want me to stop them? You're concerned about me? You think that I'm going to be full of animosity, full of envy, full of jealousy? No. Moses said, I wish that all God's people were filled with the Spirit of God and would prophesy for God. Hallelujah. The beauty of the, of the day of Pentecost, the beauty of the book of Acts, when cloven tongues of fire rested upon their heads and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues so that they could be witnesses. That's really what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is about, my friend. The, Holy, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is about the power to be a, to be a preacher. Not, not, not behind a pulpit necessarily. To be a witness for the kingdom of God. To be a witness for what Jesus has done in your heart and in your life. God wants everybody to be like El Dad and me dad. He wants everybody to be a voice piece. Amen. So how will they believe in whom they have not heard? How will they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet. Of them that preach the gospel of peace. Hallelujah. And bring glad tidings. Amen. He goes on to say right here. But they have not all believed our report. Not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So they haven't all believed the report. Like even the people that you have talked to. Don't get frustrated because you've talked to some people about the things of God and they have not, quote unquote, gotten converted yet. You do your part and leave, the, leave God's part to God. God the, the, you know, God. the Apostle Paul talked about some are called to scatter the seed, some are called to water the seed, but, G, but God is the Lord of the harvest. He brings the increase. We just got to be about the business of the Lord, doing the work that God has called us to do. You know, part of, part of it, let me not get ahead of myself, but part of it is just like letting God change us. Amen? That right there is a witness, right? Some of us more than others. Amen? Praise God. So we need a preacher. I want you to think about a couple of preachers. I put some preachers' names down here. I want you to think about the old Apostle Paul. He was a preacher. Amen? Galatians 2.20. I can see him preaching this message. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And now this life which I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He said, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Can you imagine hearing the Apostle Paul preach that in a church under the anointing? of the Holy Spirit and it's pricking and piercing your heart. Amen. And doing them. I bet you we'd be crying, huh? Don't 
you think? I think we'd be crying. There's an old preacher. I remember, oh, Aaron used to talk about these old preachers. And I remember Aaron talking about this guy right here. I could be wrong. George Whitfield, is he the one that wrote that, wrote that sermon about uh, sinners in the hands of an angry God? Or that was somebody else? John Clinnell. Okay, well, th- so this dude here, this is, a, this is a quote, okay, or this is what they said about George Whitfield. Look at this. And this is where I got that little thing from earlier. He preached Christ's willingness to save the worst of sinners. That's what, that's what Whitfield preached. He preached a message that said, no, Jesus is willing to save the worst of sinners. He preached the necessity of a sinner coming to Christ. And then, look at this, he left the sinner to God for his work. Oh, I like that. Yes, yeah, I'm always over here stressed out. Oh, if I have an altar call, nobody's going to come to the front. I don't care anymore. By the grace of God, I may not even have another altar call. I might preach till I can't preach no more, till my voice is dry and parched, and then I might just drop the mic and say, hey, Lord, I'm leaving them to you, leaving the people on the video to you, Lord. The truth of God's word went forth, and now let your anointing do a work on the inside of people's hearts. Amen? Leave the work of God to God. Understanding that only God's effectual work will ever bring a person from spiritual death to life. That's good right there. I wish I was that smart to know that God, boy, that's some good stuff. Charles Spurgeon, look at this. These are the old preachers, my friend. You ain't going to see this stuff on TBN. You're not going to see old little Joel saying this stuff. You're not going to see Rick Warren saying this stuff. Because it's a seeker-sensitive movement, and they're scared they're going to offend people. Real preachers got a backbone, and they're going to tell the truth. Charles Spurgeon said this, If sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped about their knees. Boy, isn't that good? Don't go, sinner. Don't go. To listen to the words that I speak to you. He says, imploring them to stay. He said, if hell must be filled. Let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions and let not one go unwarned and unprejudiced. Wow. Dude, if that doesn't convict you, dude, I'm convicted right now. I've been telling a lot of people at the hospital about Jesus. And then the Lord reminds me, when are you going to pray for us, Adam? When are you going to pray for Courtney or Shakita, whoever, Aqua? When are you going to pray for these people that you've been plant these seeds, all these other nurses that you've been talking to. Do you think it works, Tom? Just because you, you think you were bold and you said some stuff about me? No, we need to pray for them. Amen. Leonard Ravenhill, I used to love this. He said, Leonard Ravenhill said this, this life is nothing more than a dress rehearsal for eternity. Oh, man. 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 All these famous preachers, but what about that Samaritan woman? (laughs) What about the woman with the alabaster box that I preached about the other day? You know, from a surrendered and and selfless lives, they knew they had no righteousness to offer. Both of those women, you remember the Pharisee said if he was a real prophet, he'd know what kind of sinful woman it was that was touching him. The Samaritan woman, he said, go get your husband. She says, I don't have a husband. He said, this you say is true. You've already had five, and the one you're with now is not your husband. Dude, what? Like, he done called them out. They full of sin. They ain't got no righteousness to offer, my friend. Well, this is what it says. Look, the first one shows the power of the gospel as she lays at the feet of Jesus and she weeps. She weeps and then she wipes and she weeps and then she wipes and she does it over and over again. Her surrendered, broken body is just sitting there probably convulsing and crying and weeping over the feet of Jesus. That's part of preaching right there, my friend. When the Lord shows up and breaks us down and causes us to surrender from a life of humility, God can speak some stuff. Amen? And now what about that Samaritan woman? He entered her heart. He told her that. He said, yeah, this you say is true. That's not your husband. And I wrote these words myself. But he entered her heart, and now she has to go tell them all. If you remember the story, what did she do? She went to the village. And she told the, the people in the village, she says, look, all her pride is gone. All she knows is she done been touched by the master. And she got to go tell somebody. 
And so she says, come see this man who knows me. Now, this might be an off-color joke, but this is what I wrote. She said, somebody says, what you talking about, girl? Every man in this town knows you. No, that's not what I'm talking about. He knows me in a different way. He's not from here. He's from somewhere else. He thinks different than us, and you need to hear what he has to say. Amen? That's the Jesus she got a hold of. That's not what I'm talking about. He's different. He comes from another place. His love comes from another realm. It's different than what you and I understand. Verse 18, but I say, had they not heard? Yes. Verily their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. Listen, some people just aren't going to receive Jesus. But like Spurgeon said, let us wrap our arms around their knees and plead with them. I know it's got to be the right time. He's trying to make a point. I'm pretty sure that people in the hospital would freak out if I mean, grabbed a hold of their knees. They'd be like, get off me, dude. But you get the point. Amen. Let us pray for them that way. Verse 18, it says, but I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words into the ends of the earth. You know that that word right there. I could. I'm gonna. I'm about to close, but that he's quoting the Apostle Paul. If you look at a different uh, translation of the Bible, you can see the difference in the way that they put it. See how the verse says this: "I say, surely they have never heard, have they? Indeed, they have." And then he quotes a verse out of the Old Testament. That's what the that's what Paul's doing. Their voice has gone out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. You know what he's quoting right there? He's quoting Psalm 19. You know what Psalm 19 says? The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament declares his handiwork. God, Paul, the apostle Paul is literally saying, listen, they've all heard the truth of God's word. Even the heavens declare and preach the gospel. But even more so than that, God has sent men and women on the earth and given them a mouth to speak forth the truth. Amen? He says in verse 19, but I say surely Israel did not know, did they? First, Moses says, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation. By a nation without understanding will I anger you. See, the apostle Paul's coming to the realization, and he's saying this, listen, my heart is broken for my brothers in Israel because they have tried to establish their own righteousness. They've rejected the righteousness of God. But, but this, but, and this is what God would say, but I'm going to provoke you to jealousy. I, it's part of God's plan. For a period of time, Israel's heart is hardened. They hardened their heart towards God's plan, which allowed you and I to be grafted in. Amen? God allowed Gentiles to be grafted in, people that were not natural-born Jews. And Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I came manifest to those who did not ask for me. You know, Israel knew God. But they tried to establish their own righteousness. Now God's saying, I will make people that did not know me find me. Amen? And now the last verse. But as for Israel, he says, all the day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and an obstinate people. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you in prayer. Lord, your word has surely gone forth, Lord, and all of us in this room in some way, shape, or form, have experienced these things that were spoken in this chapter. Lord, there's been times in our own walk where we have been obstinate. You have reached out to us, and we have refused your hand, and we have deafened our ear to your cry. But Lord, there have also been times in our heart and in our life when we have softened our heart toward you. Holy Spirit, I pray for each and every person that was sitting here tonight, Lord, and those that are going to watch on video, Lord, that you would do a mighty work on the inside of each and every heart. That your word would be like a seed on fertile soil, Lord, and that it would produce a harvest, Lord God. Supernaturally, spiritually, Lord, we leave the people, we leave myself to you in the hands of God, and we let you do your work, O oh Lord. Do your work in our hearts and in our lives. Change us, refresh us, make us new, Lord. I pray for those that are in the struggle, Lord, whether it be in their marriages, Lord, in their emotional state, Lord God, in their finances, in their living situation. Lord, you see each and every person. You see their situations, Lord God, their children, Lord. We pray that you would minister to their hearts. 
Lord, we pray that you would supernaturally meet our needs, Lord. We give you glory and honor. Fill us with your spirit, Lord, that we might be witnesses for you in this darkened world. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord.